Welcome to the February uh, Lunch and Learn meeting of the League of, League of Women Voters of Monterey County. And uh, let's see, uh, do we have any announcements from uh, people on the board? Uh, let's see, George, always. <laughs> no, 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 that's a good thing. Always. Always also, the National Resources, Natural Resources Committee meeting is tomorrow, for those who still don't get enough of this, <laughs> we meet at Mariposa at noon tomorrow. You're all invited. Okay, thank you, George. Uh, anybody else on the board? Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, we'd like to recognize, oh, well, we'll just do it in the, in the uh, 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 flow of uh, introductions. Uh, we'll go around and if you're new or you're a visitor or you people have forgotten you and you just like to remind everybody, <laughs> you can, uh, just uh, uh, introduce yourself. So do we have anybody new at Fran Gaver's uh, table? Okay, all right. Uh, and uh, let's see, uh, Tyler Williamson's table. I'm new. We, we have a uh, member of city council, uh, Tyler Williamson. Thank you for coming. Melody Chris Lock, Public Water Now Managing Director. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, let's see. And uh, uh, back at uh, Carol Erickson's uh, table. I'm Marika Desmond. I'm new to the area from Sinus. I was interested in learning more about the groundwater. Oh, thank you. Right. Uh, uh, let's see, Beverly. I'd like to introduce my husband, Steve, who's also very into groundwater, and it's his birthday. Oh, wow. welcome, Steve. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you this, uh, this is one of my favorite stories. We're, we're at one of the concerts at uh, uh, the Naval Postgraduate School uh, during the summertime, and uh, Beverly and Steve are there, and I'm there, and if you've ever gone to those uh, concerts, uh, they at the beginning, they'll play the hymns uh, of the uh, different services, and uh, they ask uh, president and uh, former members of each service to stand during their uh, uh, song. And so when it comes to the Army, both Steve and I stand up, and all around us, I had this image uh, of people thinking, was our nation that desperate? <laughs> Uh, Ann Marshall's table. Do we have anybody there who would like that? Okay, and uh, let's see. Uh, I don't even recognize the people at the back table. You should all introduce yourself. Uh, Michael Apple with Land Watch. Jane Diana Martinetto. Uh, Dean Province. Joanne? Joanne Kelly. Oh, Joanne, thank you. And I'm Star Ryerson. Oh, thank you, Star. Uh, uh, many of you, I've seen your names, but I can't as associate with the uh, face yet. Okay, uh, along the outside, um, uh, let's see, anybody else would like to, uh, all right. Well, thank you, uh, everybody, for coming. Uh, you know, the, uh, the buffet is only $19, and so uh, I'd like to encourage, uh, we have, not too many tables set out, but we have a great crowd. So if you enjoy the programs, you don't have to be a member, just uh, pay at the door, just have to send in your reservation. Okay, uh, today uh, I've been uh, kidding uh, um, Janet Brennan all year when she suggested this about how are we going to make it interesting to talk. <laughs> You're going to have to reset this. But uh, anyways, so uh, uh, Gary Peterson is going to uh, uh, speak to us today, and uh, Janet Brennan is going to introduce him. It is with a great deal of pleasure that I get to introduce Gary. Peterson. I uh, first met Gary when he was the public works director for the city of Salinas. 
and I think you spoke to this then. Um, he headed up the effort to develop the Salinas Valley Basin Groundwater Sustainability Agency, and that was a year and a half process, which amazingly was a result of and consensus about um, an 11 member agency to prepare the plans that are needed to uh, meet the Grand <coughs> Groundwater Sustainability Act. Gary also is known on the Monterey Peninsula for having facilitated with uh, the Water Management District and um, Water One, the uh, Pure Water Monterey Project. And that was extremely significant because it was one of the first times where the peninsula and the Salinas Valley water users were able to come to an agreement and help resolve some of the uh, issues for the Monterey Peninsula. So Gary has a great deal of experience in building consensus, and uh, that's what's going to need, be needed for um, us to prepare the plans that are needed to uh, meet state requirements. So Gary? Thank you, Janet. Uh, always, uh, always glad to be here. Always glad to. This is my third presentation in three days. I've been, I've been making the rounds, but I'm, I'm happy to do it. I have an enormous passion for this work. Uh, you know, and uh, without water, there's, not, there's not much else. You know, uh, I always like it's, it's water. You know, the phrase that water is for fighting for. Water is not for fighting for. Water is for generating life and health and and uh, sustaining everything that we have potential as as human beings. No water, don't get any of that. I, uh, I am the first manager of this agency. We built the agency, as Janet pointed out. Uh, it gives us a lot of freedom to manage this agency since it's new uh, in new ways. So not only are we reinventing the way we look at groundwater in the Salinas Basin, we're also looking, uh, reinventing the way we're managing an agency. It's all it's very different. I'll talk some about that. I love this slide. Uh, yeah, it's raining like crazy. Um, great book, uh, Water, The West Without Water, which is a climate paleontology book that looks at several millennia of climate changes. And then, there's, you know, like there's been six ice ages, things like that. But really where we are is, it might be raining this week, but we're in an extended drought period with, which will be filled with continued peaks of drought just as we have recently seen over the last five years. In response to that drought, Governor Brown uh, signed into law SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2015, which said for the first time in the history of this state, the state will take charge of managing groundwater basins. For all the things that we are in California, and I am fifth generation on my mother's side, and I love California, and I've been many places, and I always come back because we do things our own way, but you know, we don't always do them in a the logical way. We're the next to the last state in the union to manage groundwater. Yeah. The only other state that hasn't done it is Alaska. And I, think, I think you get permafrost and tundra, so I don't think you get aquifers, I'm not sure. But they don't manage it, and we're the next to the last ones. So during the, you know, the drought where the governor mandated 25% cut by cities, and, and the cities and a lot of us said, well, what about the farmers? The truth of the matter is, is how much water that the farmers have used over the course of time in the state of California is largely, and perhaps strategically, unknown. So it is time to figure out what we're doing with that water and to make the best use of a waiting resource. And this law set out to do that. Sigma, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, applies to 515 groundwater basins, primarily to the 127 high and high priority basins. Of those, 22 are listed as critically overdrafted. And as a critically overdrafted basin, we have parts of Central, uh, Central Santa Cruz, uh, the Pajaro Valley, and the, what we call the 180-400 pressure aquifer, and I'll talk a lot more about that, which is the area around Castroville to the ocean, 
where the Castro Well Seawater Intrusion Project has worked an enormous number of projects and millions of dollars have been spent to look at seawater intrusion. We call it the 180 because the first aquifer is at 180 feet, then there's what's called the aquitard or a physical barrier, the next aquifer is at 400 feet, and then the bottom there's another deeper aquifer uh, that nobody really knows how deep it is, how much water's there, but it has not stopped us from issuing 42 permits into that aquifer without knowing what's there. Water comes out of the ground at about 94 degrees. It has to be immediately treated for arsenic and chromium. But it is the last resort with seawater intrusion. Um, so a little bit about the basin. So what if we had to form a new agency to take on this task. We didn't have to do it, but it was the termination of the valley. Uh, that there was no existing agency that was in the shape to do this, particularly as we have some very tight deadlines to do a lot of really important work. So we formed a joint powers authority, and this was what Jan was speaking to. We spent 18 months from January of 2015 through June of 2016 to form this uh, authority and establish a board. So uh, Monterey County, Monterey One Water, and these are all the members that joined the agency to uh, uh, to form the, the governance model. Joint powers authorities require a certain legislative ability, so these are all uh, eligible agencies. Got together, formed the agency, then built a board that has 11 members. We have an advisory committee of 25 members and stakeholders, and then we have a variety of subcommittees, uh, uh, planning committee, finance committee, uh, executive committee, to uh, conduct the business of the agency. Uh, we are a contract agency. I left the city of Salinas, retired, and became a contract employer, uh, employee. I work for an uh, organization called Regional Government Services, and they're great. They're a joint powers of the agency themselves that was formed uh, to provide startup support for new agencies, new organizations. They also provide staffing and filling things in. But what they could do for us when we contracted with them they took on our agency, provided a framework of, of financing, auditable financing, they manage the grants, they do all of our HR, and then they have myself and two other hourly employees that do clerk work and meeting setup, and then we have a, a financial advisor. So we're all hourly, we work as we need to work, I've only worked two 40 hour weeks since I've done this, but it allows me to focus on the work that needs to be done rather than running a big agency, and also in terms of the funding for the first several years, first two years are provided by our partners and the agricultural industry, which contributed a significant amount. So the first two years of that, and the second, starting this year uh, in, in July, our joint powers agreement said we had to come up with funding by July 1st, and we would fold it up. In all of this work with Sigma, should we fail at any point to become an agency, to make a plan or to implement a plan, the state can come in and take over our groundwater basins and manage them for us. And they have published how much they would charge to do that. And it's, it's you know, so it's a great incentive for people to work. <coughs> Although there's lots of uh, <coughs> people waiting uh, that are, I think are going to, it'll be interesting to see what happens when somebody tests that because somebody undoubtedly will, that's, that's what we do. So we have no legacy costs. All of our benefits are handled by RTS. We have no retirement costs. So we are running a really lean, tight machine. I've got a little office world headquarters over at the government center in Chilling Place. Um, and we use a lot of meeting rooms because we have a lot of meetings. So our basic principles for doing this work is understanding where people are and what they want. And that should direct our actions. I've got to tell you, I'm a process person. I will die for this process. The transparency of this process, the legitimacy of this process, the credibility of this process. I don't have the answers. I'm not a technical water guy. I got them working for me. I always will have. Got the technical people doing what they do. But in the sense of having a process where people can truly participate, know that the process is going to get done what needs to get done and their voices were heard is really critical. And that's, that's what I spend my time trying to do. So when I say that I'm really interested in understanding where people are and what they want, that's what we're trying to do. Inclusion and diversity produce better results. We've got a really strong stakeholder group. We've got disadvantaged communities. We've got the environmental interests. We've got land use planning. We've got small agencies, big agencies. Uh, and then that doing it together is the right, though difficult thing to do. 
And I will often say to the committee, as I may have said to the board, we do this together or we don't do it at all, because it will not work otherwise. So when I talk about transparency in meetings, this is what we did from, uh, this would be from uh, June, no, this, actually, I'm sorry, this would be from November 2017 to December 2018. These are the number of public meetings that we have. So the legislation says that it will be local control, we'll design the process for managing it, and then it will be a transparent process, and that data and science will drive the decisions. But this is our first year, and we're already starting out, we will have more meetings next year. So that's what I do a lot of, is, is manage meetings, and getting the information out, getting the, managing the decision-making process and review processes. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the regulatory fee because we do have to fund the agency. So all beneficiaries, sustainable groundwater management will pay. There's really only two, and it's everybody. There's the farmers and there's the people that drink it. And so we, we split we split it 90-10. Technically, if we really want to get down on it, it's the agricultural use, depending on who you talk to, is 93, seven. Uh, but we're gonna go with the 90-10 split. So ag will pay 90% of it, everybody else will pay 10% of it. There are some exemptions, federal folks, and de minimis extractors, which is one, one little solitary domestic well that does less than a couple acre feet a year, will not have to pay. But all others will pay. So we're doing it by service connection and irrigated acres. And we've gone through an enormous amount of effort to sort this all out. Here's the bottom line. Uh, if you have a house with a, with a hookup, it's gonna cost you $2.26 a year. Uh, in terms of irrigated acres, uh, it's uh, going to be 479. And for the farmers, that is extremely reasonable. They were talking about another program yesterday where they provide drinking water to disadvantaged communities that's costing them about three dollars an acre foot, uh, three dollars an irrigated acre. They thought that was the greatest deal in the world. So this keeps them compliant. This is how we're going to fund the agency. Uh, if you're really interested in this, tomorrow, two to three o'clock, Salinas uh, City Council Chambers, we will be taking up this issue and we expect it to advance. This is the area over which we have <coughs> responsibility. This is our landscape, this is our map. Uh, a couple of interesting things have changed. Um, we have, down at the bottom you see the dark green and you see the yellow and that is the Paso Robles sub-basin. So a third of that basin is in Monterey County, two thirds is in San Luis Obispo County. They have a very different approach to managing groundwater. They have five agencies and one aquifer to manage. And we have six aquifers and one agency. So, uh, and they wanted us to come down and join their party and a few of us here and there attended meetings. It's the wild west. Uh, so, and I'll just leave it at that. It's been a long time since I've heard people in public meetings threaten physical violence, but they do it. They do it regularly. <laughs> so what we did is we filed what's called a basic boundary modification, and we were able to do an administrative uh, boundary adjustment and move our part of this, of the Paso Robles Basin, which is in that greenish area, and make it part of what we call the Upper Valley, which is sort of the pink one. So that was approved Monday. So that took a lot of work, but we're there. Then we have the we have the four bay, and then the the blue area. Let's see, maybe this will look like this one. Let's see, the blue area here is the 18400. This is the CSIP area, the Castroville Seawater Intrusion Project area, where a fluent is treated for irrigation water and put on the crops in, in a theoretical effort to prevent seawater intrusion. It's the Monterey Subbasin. Right up here in this corner is Marina Coast Water District and the city of Marina who have filed to be their own groundwater sustainability agencies. This is the Seaside Aquifer, which is adjudicated by law and has been since the 90s. We do not uh, have any say over that because it's already divided up. Then down here at Greenfield, we have Arroyo Seco, who's trying to form their own. It's a really complicated mess. Um, but, <laughs> You know, we work with it. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, in terms of timelines, because this is the critically overdrafted basin, it has to be done by January 31st, 2020. We submit a plan. State has two years. They give us a year to write the plan. They have two years to approve it. Uh, the rest of the basins, the other basins, plans are due in 2022. So we have two years. So what we're doing right now is we are going crazy on this one. 
We also have the east side aquifer here, uh, and then up here we call it the Langley uh, aquifer. And then it moves across the Pajaro River up in this area. So that is our charge. I can tell you that from here to here, it's 106 miles. Because I'm learning every inch of that road. Uh, all those meetings and all those places. But that's the work that we set out to do. And we've got to create a groundwater sustainability plan for each of these areas. We are also building what is called, we're now calling an integrated sustainability plan. And it's kind of funny over in the valley, uh, you talk about this valley has a long history of working together. And then someone will laugh like they don't, but they built dams, they, they managed the river, they built CSIP, uh, they've taxed themselves to do this. Uh, so I just simply tell them that the, the goal of the integrated sustainability plan is to look at the whole system and to provide the opportunity and preserve the opportunity for people to work together. There's a north-south <coughs> issue around the water. Uh, uh, you know, it, I, I, let's, let me say right out of the gate, it's, uh, it's an amazing time to be working in water in Monterey County. <laughs> Thank you very much, George. But it's, uh, <laughs> it's just one of the many interesting changes director at the Water Resources Agency. We're a whole new agency. There's a lot going on here, and, and it is tremendously interesting. So this is our timeline. We had the Sigma started. We had the basic modification we worked on, formed our Groundwater Sustainability Agency. This is where the plan development comes, 2018 to 2020 for the first plan, 2022 for the rest of the plans. Then we have 20 years to achieve sustainability. And with five-year updates to our plan, and then you have to maintain sustainability. I would hope that we would do it for longer than 30 years, maybe like forever. <laughs> uh, so the, the state defines sustainability, and here's where I start to have an issue, and you're going to start to get some of the divergent thinking. This is the law. We built the agency. We've done everything that we're supposed to do, and we will continue to do everything that we were supposed to do. We will stay in compliance with the law. The law says that there are six areas to look at to understand sustainability. One is surface water depletion, land subsidence, degraded quality, seawater intrusion, reduction of storage, and lowering of groundwater levels. So four of those are, are present in the Salinas Valley. We don't have a, we don't have a lot of issue with land subsidence, uh, like out in the Central Valley where you see it drops 20 meters, because if we pump the water dry, seawater comes in, so there's no collapse. So we're not, and, and otherwise in other places the aquifers are shallow, so we don't have that issue, land subsidence. Surface water, we're not clear on that because the river is a very unusual river and the way it's been manhandled and everything else, we're not sure if anything that we do with groundwater will deplete that or not, but we're going to be working on that. Uh, degraded quality is an issue certainly with nitrates, seawater intrusion, one of our biggest issues. Reduction of storage. Um, you know, uh, in the ground is what this is talking about. Important to know this is all groundwater. Uh, so I'll talk more about that in a minute. And then we do know that groundwater levels have been going up and down depending on pumping. And in certain areas it's very visible, in other areas it is not. But that's what we're setting out to do. That's our roadmap and our timeline. Here is a much more traditional definition of sustainability. I sort of think in this one, you can call this sustainability, but I think it's what got broke. And now what we're trying to fix, and that there's no guarantee that if you fix those that you get sustainability. You know, it's just you fixed them, you're in balance, and the state might leave you alone, is what you got there. Real sustainability is a much broader scale based on a systems level where we look at the social, the environmental, and the, and the economic. And I gotta tell you, this leads well if you're talking about groundwater and you're talking about agriculture. You are on those. Shorthand for this is people, people, planet, and profit. But those have to be balanced if we're going to have sustainability, and everybody has to benefit as much as possible to get that. And we can't let some, we can't let this happen. <laughs> and, you know, I, uh, you know, I, one, of, one of the best comments that anybody ever made about me was Dave Stolt. He stood up in front of my city council. He's the water management uh, district uh, 
director, he stood up in front of my city council and says, you know, you really get to love Gary's sense of humor until you figure out that he isn't kidding around at all. <laughs> <laughs> kidding around about, this is, happens every day. This is what we do. This is, this is how we operate our natural resources. Hey, we've got no water in my end of the boat. And what we're going to get out of that is what we know. Okay, this is the 18400 aquifer. Here's my story about that. In this area, this, this is the Salinas city limit right here. 160,000 people on the side. Having been the public works director, I would tell you that the peak of the agricultural season, it's somewhere between 180 and 200,000. And we have no way of really knowing. So there's a, there is a differentiation here. The darker area is the 180 aquifer, which has been intruded uh, with seawater for decades. Uh, first references in the written documents were the 20s. And then we have here the 400 foot aquifer. And it is thought that the migration into the 400, you have the 180 that's had wells and seawater has come in as the waters come out, seawater has come in. And it hits these well casings and a bad well casings have allowed the water to migrate into the 400 foot aquifer where it's spreading and contaminating. The deep aquifer, which is the one that we think is down around 800, 42 wells, including Castroville's drinking water wells, and more and more the city of Salinas drinking water wells. The fear is that they will also be contaminated in the same nature. So somebody gave me this map without the dots on it. I said, can you give me a map with the wells on it? Uh -huh. So they gave me this. And I said, man, so no wonder we got a problem. Look at all those wells. And then they, they looked at me and said, well, well, that's not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, how much is it? They're like, well, it's 40%. We think it's about 40%. I said, well, how many wells are there? And they said, well, we really don't know. And that's where I get people upset when I'm like, well, well how do you know it's 40% if you don't know how many wells there are? Uh, so that's what we're up against, that, that level of data. Now, part of this I totally understand. People have been putting wells in there since the teens and 20s of the last century. They get plowed over, they get tractored over, they're in the ground, you don't know. But the fact of the matter is the Water Resources Agency has identified 180 wells that are a threat to the aquifers, and they remove two a year. So, um, you know? How many of those unknown wells do we think are 180 feet or most of them are more shallow? Probably, probably the older wells because people would only ever go as far as they needed to go to get the water. So most of them are in that area. But we're trying to understand this and I know Marina Coast has flown it with new technologies. We're all trying to figure out how to see in the ground. Uh, a lot of new emerging technologies, we'll see if we get there or not. But what you have here is a lot of people who have taken what they needed for their own benefit, and we have a classic case of the tragedy of the commons. And that's where you have a resource uh, when any individual acting independently, working from their own self-interest, depletes a shared resource, and when everybody does that, it's gone. And that's exactly what is happening in the 18400, and much of what is happening in the rest of our aquifers and throughout the state, and hence the legislation. Um, this happens when people don't talk to each other about what they're doing. This happens when people go out of their way to not make data available so you make the best decision. I'm, you know, I, when, I work, when I talk to the growers, and I have an enormous amount of respect for the growers. Uh, most all of them work longer days every day than most of us work. I, mean, I like them a lot. They're industrious, smart people. Um, but, you know, they're going to work in their own self-interest. They're going to protect their companies. They're going to protect their family holdings. And they're going to do this. And the last thing I, I tell them this, when I speak to them, I'm no different than the rest of you. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. But the fact is, is what we're trying to do in Sydney is to move from an individual self-serving decision making <coughs> to a collective beneficial conversation around resource management. And that is the very edge of the world in which we stand now, because it's not just water. Although water is highly critical, it's air, it's population, it's, you know, it's just uh, an unwillingness to look at the consequences of behaviors that we're comfortable with and, and take a longer generational view on that. And there are, if we want sustainability, 
Sustainability is not going to come from projects, it's not going to come from programs, it's not going to come from science. It's going to come from people using those tools because they decide that there's something they don't want to lose. And I think it's, a, you know, I read a, a really interesting phrase, which I think we're all going to hear a lot more of real soon. It was one of the ever-growing long list of presidential candidates who also appear to be so young and bright. Um, and one of them was talking about generational equity and generational justice. And what are you going to do? Are you going to leave it for us? You know, and, and you know, you got the millennials are wicked smart. They get it. So what are we going to do about that? I think it's really important that we have to start having these conversations. So when we have these conversations, and here's where I come into my process thing, is I do have the forms, the models, the structures for having really difficult conversations. And one of the things you need to know is if you want new thinking, you're going to take a trip straight through the grown zone every single time. We've all been there. You'll be sitting in a meeting. You're trying to figure something out. You're like, why am I here? This makes no sense. We've talked about this again and again and again. That's when you know you're in the grown zone. And if you haven't been there, most of us have been there. Well, many of us here have a few miles on the road. Uh, we've been there and back. Uh, but if you haven't been there, I've given this slide presentation enough times to know that three months from now, some of you will be sitting in a meeting and you'll be going, oh, this is that grown zone thing you guys talk about. Because <laughs> we'll do it all the time. But if we do not have the conversations in there that we need to have, if it's an iterative process and we create a shared framework of understanding, that we, share, we create an agreed upon reality on which we are making decisions, then we can get to the new thinking. But we've got to take that right. So part of the process is to let people know this is a sticky business. We're going to do it. But we've got to hang in with it. We've got to remember that we need to have these conversations. Another model I work a lot with is I become more and more fascinated with the neuroscience of what we know about how people work together, what we know. Uh, we know more about the brain. We've learned more about it in the last 10, 15 years than we've ever known in all of history combined. So, uh, this is Dr. David Rock in his book, uh, out of his uh, book, uh, Your Brain at Work. But he identified these areas where, that are, create resistance to change. And this is brain chemistry. And if we want to move people, what we have to do is allow people to have status, that each of you has, has status, credibility, meaning that your word has value. Everybody wants certainty, no matter how hard it is. They want certainty that the process will continue, they'll work through it, but you've got to provide a structure that's stable, that you allow autonomy, that people can make the decisions that they need to make and, and exercise control, that people should see that if they participated, they should be able to see some example of them having influence in the process. But the two that I think are most important, and I'm really, really on about, are relationships because it's who we are together and how we are together is more important than what we do together. We cannot get to good solutions if we are not together in legitimate, honest processes, having difficult conversations. And finally, the number one thing that people want in staying in your process and working with your process is the sense is what you're doing is fair. And, you know, listen to a kid. The first thing that, you know, out of their mouth every time will be about it's not fair. You know, fairness is we are programmed for fairness, we are programmed for equity, we do a lot of things that take us down those different paths, but we can build our processes to take into consideration so we can have those conversations. If we don't have the conversation, we're not going to get there, and this is where we're going to be. And, you know, my wife's a huge fan, and it's not going to get more. But he's right. I mean, and with 64 public meetings, I'm providing the opportunity for any number of people to answer this question, I worked on water. And we're trying to do that. And we've got to have these conversations. It is generational. Anybody know what that is? The water temple. It is the Pogus Water Temple. And, you know, so what, whether the Hetch Hetchy Project was the right thing to do or not, at the time what they did was marginally a, uh, uh, engineering miracle to move that water gravity flow across. But you know what? They never lost the wonder and the amazement and the beauty of the work they were doing. And they built four of these temples, I've been to all of them, uh, to mark the work that they did and said, we have done something that matters here. We have done something for history and we have done something that goes forward. I want that back in our work. I don't want to just turn it over to attorneys. I don't want to just, you know, do just enough. I want us to get it right, and I want us 
to be proud of ourselves for doing it and mark those important monumental conversations that we need to have. This is what's on the line. Could you speak more to that? I actually am not familiar. Oh, with the, with the water temple? <coughs> I don't worry. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, I should have done that. So the Hetch Hetchy Water Project runs from a canyon. No, no, I'm saying the, 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 the temples. Yeah. So it's the Hetch Hetchy Water Project, which moves water from a canyon next to Yosemite by gravity flow across the Central Valley onto the, to the San Francisco Peninsula. And when you drive down 280 and you see the big reservoirs, deposits the water there, along the way generates electricity for all the cable cars in San Francisco. So all of the water, for most all of the water for San Francisco Peninsula and much of the electricity comes from this project that was built by the city of San Francisco, where they reached up, much as Los Angeles reached up into the Owens Valley and took the water there, San Francisco reached across the valley and brought it there. But it, but it, is, a, it is an enormous legacy and it continues to work. But for me, the point is that, you know, it, we need to think about how we look at these things. And they are monumental, these things that we're trying to do. And we need to honor that and recognize that uh, and understand the, the importance of the work and the consequences of the work. And the temple is where? This is on Kenyatta Road off of Edgewood Road in 280. And you get off Edgewood Road, you go down and go right. Uh, and you go down Kenyatta Road, it's a really great road. In San Mateo. In San Mateo, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, there's also quite a trail down in there that can take you up by the reservoirs and the dams and everything else. It's, it's an amazing water project. I don't know what this is. You know, I can tell you about my grandfather's water projects, my father's water projects. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been in California five years. Water, you cannot. It's what we do. But this is what's on the line. And, you know, I heard somebody articulate this very clearly about this bubble that we're in and the need to stop. Just think, I mean, yes, we have to, every one of us act locally. But there's so much on the line here. And it's the old Buckminster Fuller spaceship Earth thing. But we've got to get this water thing right in those conversations. So with that, uh, I didn't say this enough. SVBGSA.org. Uh, get back to you there. Uh, SVBGSA.org. Uh, all of our plans, all of our meetings, all of our agendas, everything is on that website. It's pretty comprehensive. And I'll be happy to take questions and comments. Uh, let's see. You have to wait. You'll be called on. Let's see. Our Janet, are you going to call on people since we get a little flack on people from people who don't get called? So I'm going to let Janet pick you out and then wait until I get to you with the microphone. I, I do have one comment. You, I get closer your to the speech yeah. was so brilliant, but it was so fast. Yeah, yeah. And you describe the Joint Powers Agency. But that's not the governing board. So do you want to describe how the Joint Powers Agency merged into the, or established the governing board? Sure. OK, yeah, yeah great point. Uh, so, and, and I generally believe this about most all of our processes, is that you have to do governance first. The, the thing that we care about is not just fairness, but how do we decide? Uh, those of you familiar with the community power, aggregate power, they almost lost the whole thing because they did governance last. After they did all the science and everything else, everybody wanted to fight about who decides. So we decided early on, we formed the JPA. The JPA and the group forming that decided the constituency of the board. The, there's 11 members, and we went back and forth on whether it would be 9 or 11, uh, and there are still folks that think they should have more seats. But we ended up with 11 representing the valley in a broad spectrum. So a joint powers authority d doesn't have to be the governing body. They appoint the governing body. So each of our constituents, like the agricultural folks, representatives, they, they uh, vote among themselves uh, and appoint people based on uh, areas. Uh, and then they show up and they're on the board and they answer to their own constituency. The, uh, we have a series of caucuses, the environmental folks. Uh, put there, they put you on. Uh, and, and when they want people on the advisory committee and stuff, they, they work among themselves to staff that. We have uh, the county holds other agency seats. Uh, we have South County seats. We have public water company seat, uh, which is currently held by Cal-Am. We have a public at large uh, seat. 
Yeah, uh, excuse me, cow, cow water. I can't remember. Well, I'm over here. What do you know? Uh, uh, and I know I'm not getting them all, but it's 11 members. And uh, does that answer your question? Yes. And, and very broad ranging and, and really a good board. So, uh, Jim? Uh, Jim on occasion when I've been driving out of the country, I've observed big fields with uh, sprinklers scattered all over on hot summer days. Is that a reflection of current technology in agricultural use of water? Sadly, it is. Uh, I, I like to talk about, uh, if you take the drive to Castroville on a summer afternoon, it's 3 o'clock, the wind's blowing 30 miles an hour in the valley, uh, the crops are two and a half feet tall, uh, and uh, the rainbirds are going and the water's hitting the windshield of your car. I, I asked the farmer, I said, why do you do that? And he said, what do you expect me to do with all that irrigation equipment I spent money on? <laughs> well, that's, you know, that, that's, that's a reasonable answer. It's not the answer I want. Uh, we, uh, more and more and more <laughs> folks have gone to drip. There's been a huge shift to drip irrigation particularly uh, uh, among the vintners, the, the grape growers, who practice precision farming in ways that other farmers will have to adapt to. Uh, but that is one of the things that we're, there'll be conversations about because that is highly ineffective use of water. Anna, are there... Uh, Chuck Langley. Can, can the agency lobby for tax incentives for the farmers to go drip? because it's much more expensive. I mean, most have been told that to get rid of what they use and then to put in the drip was tremendously costly. It, it is very expensive, and that's one of the, you know, especially after you've spent a lot of money on, on lumen and piping. I'm not sure what that answer is. Um, we could certainly advocate for tax incentives, although I'm not sure who would give the tax incentives. Uh, we do have the ability with the, with the agency to set a number of economic uh, incentives or disincentives. Silvia? Well, Silvia. Oh, yeah. Usually stand up. Yeah, yeah I have. <laughs> the, uh, two questions. You have a lot of people in the governing board, not only the board, but the executive or whatever. How do you reach consensus? And the second thing is that within your program, do you plan to put out educational programs to the farmers and to educate them what is the best way to go forward? Yes. Thank you. Well, education has to be a part of everything we do with a lot of information on the website. As we get the plans into place, it's important to understand we're developing a plan right now. Uh, that plan will have educational programs embedded into it so everybody knows what they need to do, and we'll continue to look at that. I can answer that one for sure. Gosh, how do you get to consensus? Uh, you keep having the conversations till you get there. Um, you build, as I, I mentioned earlier with the grown zone, uh, we have carefully built, I think, a shared framework of understanding of what we're trying to do and what we have uh, in our hands to do it with. So a lot of what uh, people know, they know what the outside limits are, they know where the inside limits are. We keep it, the conversations focused and together so that as we, something that takes months of time is developmental, we keep bringing in and layering in more and more information. One of the things I think I do is, is understanding when people are ready to decide. Uh, I think that that's one of the pieces of the art of process, because I can keep bringing you information, and you may not be ready to decide. At some point, we might have to because of timelines, <clears throat> but readiness for the larger group is one of the best ways to get to consensus. And you'll have group members who stand out as, uh, I like to think of them as the, the canaries of the coal mine. Or, or someone who has a certain way of looking at things and I know if they have what they need that they probably represent a, a fair amount of the group that has what they need. So there's uh, lots of experience in that. We have worked with some very skilled facilitators as well. I 
just want to add that I think the consultant is playing a major role in terms of our being able to come to an agreement. Uh, he's bridging some gaps that have separated the water users in the Salinas Valley Basin for a long period of time. So I think that's a major element of it as well. Uh, Michael? No. So uh, when you have a tragedy of the commons, you often have to uh, restructure the incentives, um, have pricing associated with water, have uh, limits, have been, you know, that's often an economic calculus. Have you thought about how that would play out in the valley with cities and, and farmers, and do you have people looking at those options? Yeah, so the uh, Derek Williams, the consultant that that, uh, that Janet mentioned, who is very good at communicating complex stuff to to regular folks, he's, he's exceptional at that, has a, built a team. One one of his team members does nothing but economic incentives, programs, programmatic on irrigation as done throughout the West, including uh, looking at land following for recharge, where where the farmers put together a pool of funding to pay somebody not to grow for a couple of years, and then you put water on that land and let it recharge. Or that people, uh, we've spoken to a number of people on water markets uh, who start to use markets as like, well, maybe I don't want to grow, maybe it's better for me to sell my water or move my water for credits. So all of those are on the table. Uh, and have to be, I think one of the things I was talking to George about this earlier, uh, is I just sort of look at little key things that pop up, but the first ever water pricing index was created by NASDAQ uh, about two weeks ago. And this is the thing that starts to set a value on water so that it can move into the market. Uh, I also like to point to, if you, ever, if you saw the movie, The Big Short, where the people figure out how to short the housing market, the really smart guy, the drummer, at the end they said, where are you going? And read on, he wrote on the glass, I'm off to do water. <laughs> so uh, I think we're going to see a lot of that. The gentleman back there. You're probably the most knowledgeable person in this room about the timeline that we need. Do you think that timeline outlined by, this, outlined by the state is adequate, or do you think we're just fooling ourselves thinking we've got 10 to 20 years? That's a good question. Uh, uh, I think we need to move with great haste. I think that we need to, I mean, certainly I spend uh, a fair amount of time trying to work with the sense of urgency, primarily because of that short deadline. Uh, at least we've started. Um, this, this is how I see it, because when I look at the big plan and I look at sustainability, and the state and dictating their state sustainability criteria, no way can somebody tell you what that plan is going to look like in 20 years. Nobody can tell you what anything is going to look like in 20 years. But by setting the law and pushing people towards action, something is now going to happen. It is now on the radar. It is now receiving an enormous amount of focus and resources so it will change. That's how we create change. Will it change the way the state has so carefully dictated? I'd be surprised. I, you know, it's so funny, I, I sometimes feel like uh, I'm having to work through my own karma here as a public works director because of how much of a hard time I gave planners over my career because I like to build things, you know, I'm a public works guy. Uh, and so it's some sort of karmic retribution I've now planned. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it all comes around. But I think the point is to, to start to create plans, to start to shift the conversation and hope we're in time. I haven't seen the data. I am deeply concerned about seawater intrusion in the 18400 aquifer. I believe that's a very real threat that has to be dealt with much sooner than later, that 20 years will be too late if pumping continues as it has. Certainly if the management or lack of management of that aquifer has, does not change, there will be consequences. I sat in a meeting um, earlier this year with the public health officer, Dr. Moreno from Monterey County, and we were talking about because the, the Water Resources Agency declared an emergency. 
uh, in the 18400. In fact, what they did was they said, we have an emergency seawater intrusion, it's getting worse. But we have this new agency and they should fix it. <laughs> That's pretty much what they did. Uh, but I did let them off the hook, drug them into the process. But the thing that, that you learn as, as you go through that is that, um, that there, are, there are bound to be real consequences for that seawater if we do not take it on now. That includes the expansion of CSIP, that includes a lot of, of uh, infrastructure that was uh, designed to, to eliminate seawater intrusion, it needs to be looked at, needs to be rebuilt. The dams on the river that provide an enormous amount of source are broken. Uh, so there's a lot, you're going to hear a lot about the money needed to get this thing on track. Uh, Beverly? Uh, the only thing that we're going to know in 20 years is when the next solar eclipse is going to be. Yeah, we'll give you that. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. My question goes to carrying capacity. How much can we pump? And that does the act mandate that all well pumping be monitored and made public so that we know how much we're extracting? And if the act doesn't do that, will this agency do that? Until you measure what you're pulling out, you don't know the numbers. You're absolutely right. And uh, there's an ordinance uh, the Water Resources Agency has that's designed to keep that information out of the public's hands. Uh, and, and we've had to really bend over backwards. Uh, it's, you know, I, I, I want to be careful with the, talking about the other agency, but it, it, it's, it's a challenge uh, because uh, somebody kept saying, well, they're not giving us information. I says, well, what happens when, what happened the last time they gave you information? Well, it was terrible. I said, so you, you were critical of the information they gave you. Well, it was. So you're somehow surprised when they stopped giving you information. <laughs> That's what happened. So people, you're critical of the information I gave you. I'm going to stop giving it to you. So we have to work through that. We have got our hands on a lot of the data. We are putting together all the data that we have, including uh, an enormous amount of data we found in the Environmental Health Department on wells. We're working with water resources, we're working with the state. And then what we will do is in our plan, we will designate areas where there are gaps of information in the plan. We'll call for projects to put monitoring in. Will we get to monitoring on every well? I'm not sure. One of the things that we're looking at with technological advancement is that they're starting to use satellite imagery to measure uh, evapotranspiration or actually the, the, the amount of water that moves onto property that either goes into the ground or evaporates or stays with the crops. So there's a lot of people working on that. I, I like to use the analogy of uh, there are now more cell phones in this world than there are people and that 90% of the countries that have cell phones never had a hardwired phone line in their country. They went straight to the new technology. I think a lot of us are going to end up going to some kind of measuring technology that doesn't have every well measured. It's extremely expensive. Howard? Uh, do you have any concerns about the way the oil company can, is disposing of their wastewater in South County? Um, <coughs> well, let, uh, let me, let me this, yes, of course. Of course, I have concerns. We should all have concerns about how wastewater is disposed of on anybody's use. We do have Chevron at the table. Uh, actually, they've been a very good partner in this. Uh, we went and saw their wetlands and what they do with their wastewater. Uh, I know that our consultants are, are looking at it very closely to see how that impacts the Upper Valley Aquifer. So I don't have data, but you know, I have concerns of all wastewater randomness. Wastewater treatment run the been responsible for wastewater in many different ways, and we need to always be careful about that. Is it good or bad? I don't know yet. Do I have the science? Um, the lower level of the water closer to the has microphone, been declined, and aren't the disposal wells below that level? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. That. What was the question? I was just trying to clarify. Whether well, the disposal wells were below the aquifer yes, that's they, been measured. They are injecting wastewater into the deep aquifer, which they maintain will never be used for drinking water or potable water supplies. So we are taking all of that information into account in our plan. So I would watch for that to show up. 
Um, speaking of wells, does your agency have any jurisdiction over the slant wells that Calium proposes? And the second part of that is, what do you think taking 15,000 acre feet of water out of the groundwater basin, which is what Calium proposes to do, will do to seawater intrusion? Well, so we have uh, competing science on, on, those, uh, on those areas, so I don't know until the science gets cleared up as to what's happening. We have no say over the slant wells. That's with the CPUC and the Water Quality Control Board is not, does not reside with us. City of Marina did file a, um, to be a GSA over the slant well areas. Uh, we're trying to work with that. It's an administrative process. I don't know. I'm listening, I'm monitoring, I'm paying close attention. There's a lot of question about whether those wells are or are not in fresh water or in a ground wall, in the 18400 or are they in the dunes aquifer. So this is a, this is a, you know, I, I would say honestly, there's a lot that needs to be known before decisions are made. Uh, but what we have are definitely science on two sides of a historical disagreement. So it should not be surprising that the science does not agree. George? <clears throat> a quick question. Do you have enforcement authority on getting information, or is it all planning and requesting? No, we, we, uh, my attorney tells me that we do have the, we can get paid what we need it if, if, if necessary, but we've, continue to take a diplomatic approach and uh, which is as you get that some of you will not get answers you're looking for from me because I am diplomatic and, and I speak for my board and not for myself uh, so there's there's a big difference there um, but we can get data and we have found ways to get we think just about everything that exists we've had to sign a lot of confidentiality agreements we've got to do the use but we think we've got what is available the question is is what available is is it good? Is it accurate? Is it useful? So that's what we're starting through. Roger? Uh, <clears throat> terrific presentation. Inspires a lot of confidence in me that you and your, <clears throat> your team will put together a plan and it will be a good plan. Then what? Who gets to enforce it? Does it go to the DWR or what happened to the county or <coughs> back to the agency? Thank you for. Uh, for giving me the lead into one of my, you know. At some point, the, the Groundwater Sustainability Agency, right now we're a planning agency. We're designing a plan that has projects, it has programs, it has monitoring, we'll have enforcement. What do we want to be when we grow up? Do we want to be that agency? Or does the Water Resources Agency who perhaps should be that agency, and at the beginning could have been that agency, but we, they, we lack the confidence in their ability to produce that plan. So the governance of water in Monterey County going forward, I think is a really big conversation. We know, we're, one of the things we're learning with, you know, if you look at the Marina Coast, and you look at the 18400, and you, you, the, the crossover between the ocean and the valley, uh, we're not sure, people are not sure about where the bottom of the seaside aquifer is and where does that tie into aquifers in the valley. We are connected. If I could tear down one thing in Monterey County for all of our issues, it would be the Levis Curtain. I think that the entire county needs to start working together coherently, uh, usefully, and cooperatively on many things, including transportation, water, there's a housing, there's all of the big issues. We've got to do a better job of talking to each other. We just have to. There's too few resources and the need is too great. But I'm really curious about water. Do we need multiple agencies? I'm reading a lot of work about networked governance. Um, perhaps the, the GSA needs to continue to exist. The Water Resources Agency let go of their previous contract manager and now has a new manager who's looking at things very differently. And she's, she's quite interesting. She brings a, a different background to it. Um, what will that agency look like? Because we need comprehensive water management. I'm sitting here looking at sustainability, quality and quantity in 20 years, the same as it is now, and I'm supposed to get that by using only groundwater. The river is critical to that. The river recharges every one of those basins. Rainfall, are we capturing, are we making the best use of rainfall? Are we putting it back in the ground? What are the projects we need, and who needs to do them, and how do we need to manage it? 
I very much come down on the governance side, and I think we need a new model. In fact, I, I'm pretty much determining that we need new models for all resource management because of the tragedy of the commons, so that we can have a different perspective on, on you know, sometimes, in, and I attended a workshop years and years and years ago that George Riley put on, and everybody, the, nobody that left was ever the same. But it was around community, but one of the things that, that, you know, we talked about community and what is the purpose of community, and it's sometimes how we slice the pie, and how we come together to decide who gets what, and, and that that's the work that we do, that's the work we need to do, and as I said, got to speak to a lot of young people the other day, is, you know, the first words in the Constitution are we the people. And, uh, you know, one of the things, and I always agree with George, but I certainly always believe that the number one responsibility of the citizen is to participate in democracy. And certainly your organization believes that. <laughs> I think that that is a splendid <laughs> closure to this very complex conversation, and thank you so My much.